I heard that dog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, so I'm Dave from Page 158 Books. That's George from South Carolina. Um, we're here to talk about his awesome new book, You Want More Selected Stories. A um, couple of quick housekeeping things. There's a chat over on the side there. You can pop questions in there. If you put a question mark on the end of everything, it's going to give you, on the end of a sentence, it's going to give you the option to put it in the Ask a Question um, uh, link. And if you do that, what we can, what people can do is upvote your question if they want to. And then at the end, we'll we'll go through the questions and, and ask George. So if you have any questions throughout the um, throughout the night, just feel free to throw them in there. And then there's also this green buy the book button that's right underneath the video. I mean, that's why we're here. Buy the book. Um, buy the book. Buy the book. <laughs> George is a great guy. We want to make sure that he can uh, stay in bourbon. So listen. Um, I'm wearing these shoes tonight. I need some new shoes. <laughs> Those are great. Buy the book. <laughs> so speaking of bourbon, what um what do you got? I'm drinking um Cooper's Craft. Okay. Excellent. Um I'm drinking um Uncle Nearest, which is uh sorry, the glare is a little harsh there, but it's a Tennessee premium whiskey. Technically not a bourbon, but I, I did have to bring out my bottle of um my bottle of Blanton's that yeah. um got that little horse on it. My my buddy George hooked me up with when uh we came to Spartanburg. Well, gosh, when was that? It feels like a million years ago. Seems like a million years ago. So it may have been right about a year ago, right? Yeah, it would, it would have been have September, been. right? Yeah. yeah it September, would, yeah. Yep. It absolutely would have been because um our wedding anniversary is the thirteenth and SIBA is always right that same weekend, yeah. the fourteenth or something like that. Um so we came to um Spartanburg and got to go to the wonderful Hub City bookshop. And uh they're the ones who who publish your book so they're a fantastic group um you have the cup i have the shirt read right self yeah. they're great people um there it is and uh cheers to them for cheers. for putting your book out that's great cheers so um when we were at siba uh you were with jonathan hopped and uh, there was a conversation about the pat conroy um center and what was the, what was the going on there that that you were there to talk about? Do you remember? A, they put out a book called uh, Prince of Scribes, yep. and um, there were a bunch of essays about Pat Conroy. And the funny thing is, I didn't know Pat Conroy very well. And between us, you know, I admire him a lot. I admire a lot of writers and, and all that, but I'm not like a Pat Conroy kind of writer. And the time I met him. It was just funny. I mean, because I'd said, it's a true story. My last name's Singleton. And I said, and, you know, he wrote the great Santini. And I said, hey, Mr. Conroy, uh, my mom and I used to call my dad the great Singletini because he was kind of like that guy. And Pat Conroy, bless his soul, you know, put his arm around me and said, I'm so sorry. And, and then we just started drinking. And then the next day, the next morning, Ron Rash, uh, he and I were had driven down to Atlanta together and we were leaving. And he said, Mr. Conroy wants to see you. It was like breakfast, you know, brunch, breakfast, whatever this hotel. And I said, okay. So I went down there and I knew his wife. I'd, I'd met her. So I came down and, and I had a great review in the Atlanta journal constitution for my book, why dogs chase cars. And it was like a full page thing. So I went down there and he was holding it. He was shaking it. And he goes, look at you. Look at you. Mr. Big, Mr. Big. And I said, hey, Mr. Conroy. And he, I swear to God, he said, and he's real loud because he's kind of deaf. And he said, yesterday you were shit on my shoe. And tomorrow you're going to be shit on my shoe. But today you're Mr. Big. <laughs> and his wife, uh, Cassandra, kept saying like, Pat, Pat, <laughs> Pat, like that. Because people were looking around. And I, because I, you know, I, I understand things, but I said, now, why are you here? You're, you're pushing like a cookbook or something, right? And he went, oh, you got me. You got me. So then he and I were buddies after that. You know, right. this college called Furman. He went to Citadel. They're big rivals. So we used to make these bets. I mean, 
hundred dollar bets. I bet you a hundred dollars Furman will beat Citadel. Oh God damn you! Okay, you know you you're on. We never oh. paid each other. You know, yeah, it, it that's was great. great. So I kind of loved him, and I really love her. She's a, she's a great. Uh, she's wonderful. Yeah, great person living down in Beaufort. Yep, yep. And uh, you mentioned Ron Rash. You guys have a uh, a bit of a history that's kind of uh, kind yeah. of surprising. Yeah, it's kind of, it's so weird. I mean, when I tell this story, um, when I was fourteen. And Ron was 19, and this buddy of mine, Phil Snotty, Phil Snotty and Ron were runners, and they ran at this, uh, they they got track scholarships at this place called, at the time, Gardner Webb College. Gardner Webb College had a great um, track coach named Bill Freeman, Coach Freeman. And Phil said to Coach Freeman, I got a little buddy back in Greenwood, South Carolina, who's a good distance runner. I'd like for you to meet him. So he said, well, bring them on. I couldn't even drive back then. My parents brought me up. They let me let me off and uh, it's different times. Uh, so Phil and um, Ron were roommates. And I went up there like three or four times and did these workouts with Coach Freeman. At the time, I'd run like a, I was like 14 years old and I'd run a 10 minute and 20 second two mile. Hmm. You know, that's, that's five, good. five, 10 a mile. Yeah, that's great. I ran a 27, 19, five miles. So whatever. But um, so some years went by. And then there's all these stories about Coach Freeman used to say, next time George comes, have him bring fireworks because South Carolina you can buy fireworks. Right. No, we, we were, and this is so environmentally incorrect. Ron and Philip and I and Coach Freeman were shooting fireworks in the, in the Broad River, not the French Broad, the Broad River. We were shooting it off of a bridge. Some cops showed up. We went, here comes some cops. And we went running and jumped into the woods. And there was a 55-gallon drum. And there were briars. We got cut up to hell. We didn't get caught by the cops. Um, then 100 years seemed to go by. Or, you know, well, that was 1974. And about 1988, uh, Ron showed up at this place where I was teaching college. And I said, Ron Rash, that sounds familiar. He said, so does George. Are you little George? Because I only weighed about 90 pounds back then. Um, Phil, Philip's little buddy. And I went, yeah. And then we ended up living close to each other. I lived in Dacusville, South Carolina. He lived in Pendleton, 20 miles away. Back in the 90s, we were both trying to write. We were both struggling excited to get good re uh, rejections but you know and he, he i mean i talked to ron yesterday and we talk a lot that's phenomenal ron, that's so cool yeah and you've been in you've been in south carolina a long time are you you're born in california but moved here when you were little <laughs> yeah my dad was a, a merchant seaman mm -hmm. um he i was born in 1958 he had cancer in 1960 he had he fell 45 feet into the hold of a ship, the empty hold of a ship in 1963, broke his hips, his back, 57 bones. We moved to South, you know, he was a morphine addict. He uh, drank a half a gallon of vodka a day, hmm. Arvon, all this stuff. We moved to South Carolina because his dad had moved to South Carolina and, and we just, uh, he was going to work for his dad, um, my grandfather. Um, kind of working under the table, you know, and mm -hmm. they got in a big fight. It's a long winded story. And then my father started a business to compete with his own dad. We had to put it in mom's name because dad was disabled. It's a long winded white trash story. Well, good fodder for, oh for man, 45, for 45 yeah. in Callis town. And yes, yeah, it's, it's fucking, cool. oh, sorry. I didn't mean to say that word. Um, it's, it's everything I, I don't even make up stuff, you know. I just go right. Here's that well. Let me put the bucket down. You know? So I, I was wondering that when I was uh, I was crying, laughing, reading the um, the longest. Uh, uh, how are we gonna How are we gonna win this one? Or is, is that the name of it? The the yeah. one a little league game. Um, how are we gonna lose this one? How are we yeah. gonna lose this one? Right. Yeah. Just oh my god! It, this is exactly the type of. I can't tell you like the 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 timing of your book coming out um in this year of just insanity plus 
so many books that are coming out are, are i mean there's some great stuff coming out but a lot of what we're getting in the store right now is you know these very hot political books and that kind of thing and it's it's kind of too much you know um i don't want to read that i really don't i want to read something yeah. where i can you know kind of escape and laugh and um your book was perfect for that oh, so okay. i i would say you know to everybody listening that you know if 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 you're not familiar with george's work um this is a great book to pick up you'll laugh you'll cry you'll you know i, I mean it's it's fantastic it's just so absorbing and uh, i really like how you do the um how 45 and and the callous town and mendel and the the, the both the characters and the places kind of keep coming back yeah. um and so it reminded me of a story that you told about and I can't remember her name from Algonquin, the one that um, about, Shannon. yeah, yes, yeah, Shannon. Yeah. So about, about the story, uh, was it kissing the, the beginning, kissing the end? Yeah. Yeah. Shannon is maybe the best, um, maybe the best uh, piece of writing advice I've ever gotten. And she said, she's got a real Southern accent. She's a great editor. She's the great, one of the great editors of all time. I mean, she did, she was editor of uh, uh, Best American Short Stories for years, mm -hmm. and then Stories from the South for years. And then she said to me, George, a great short story's ending kisses the beginning. <laughs> Too many of your stories are groping the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that vote of confidence. Right. Um, but she's right. You know, I, I, and now it's made it easier. I mean, since I've learned that, God almighty. So in that book, uh, um, you want more. I had to look at the title. You want more. You know, the last maybe 10 years, she told me this in about 2004. So however many years. Um, I've gone, okay, I've started at a, I've started at a um, uh, drive-in movie theater. I got to either end at a drive-in movie theater or have a character drive past a drive-in movie theater or have a, somebody say, remember getting popcorn that time at that drive? You know, so there's got to be a little echo, you know, yep. and it's, and that's work. It's been the best for me. It's then when, I, when I'm writing a story, I'm going, da, 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 da. like right now I'm in the middle of the story. I'm going, where am I going to end? And I know, oh yeah, that beginning, there were these four pickup trucks filled with flea market shit but they're playing the um they're playing ice cream music you know ice cream truck songs and um which is a um which is a racist song turkey in the straw so i know that it has to end with that going by mm -hmm. it helps yeah yeah you, you've been doing the uh um i, I know you've talked before about the, the whole novel thing. And, um, I love the, the story about, you know, the Raymond Carver, um, novel class. <laughs> That's just so brilliant. And I was, I, I know you've written a couple that you don't really care for, but, um, your short stories are fantastic. So it's good enough. Don't, don't change. Don't listen to anybody. Well, you know, I, I'm still, you know, I got to in the last, in the last year and a half, I, I went, Oh, God almighty, that's a great idea for a novel. And I'm typing like hell. And I wrote and I was writing every day. You know, about three quarters through, I went, this, this is not good. And it's what I've always thought. But I finish it. I always do that. But I know it's not good. And then what makes me feel better is this was writer. He's dead now named Barry Hanna down in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And I was reading an a interview with him. And he went, I don't know how many um um, novels I've written that just didn't work, but I've salvaged some short stories out of it. And, and I've done that. So if you, um, if one were to someone, somebody was an idiot scholar and looked about my last five books of short stories, they'll go, Hey, you know, you put all these together. Kush keeps showing up. Right. And it would kind of be that novel's kind of in there, you mm -hmm. know, or, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for better or worse, I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't, that's just the way I, way I've been doing it. So your your um your locations um all invented, right? You, you based, invented, yeah, based invented. on reality, but 
Well, you know, here's a, here's a funny story. Hmm. Um, I'm from a town called Greenwood, South Carolina. There's a little town right down the road, the kind of closest town is called 96. And when I wrote Half Mammals of Dixie, in my mind, it was 96, but I didn't want to call it 96. So I told Shannon Ravenel, I said, let's call it 69. <laughs> he said, we are not going to have a town called 69. Uh, so I call it 45. And then 45 kind of worked because it's, you know, a record platter. Uh, um, Colt 45. A gun, a Colt 45, yeah. the drink, Colt the 45. Drink, yeah. yeah. So it kind of worked, you know, for that. Um, but then the others, I've just kind of, oddly enough, um, even as small as 45 was, I went, I said, I have a lot of people to talk about. So I kept getting smaller, like Gruel is a little bit smaller and Callis Town's a little bit smaller and I don't know, I don't know, uh, whatever other towns are in, in between. That one novel I wrote, there's only like three or four people living in that town on a kind of a hummock or something. So, <laughs> so as you, as you write these, um, you know, I, I'd imagine you, you, you do have some, you ha, you, you almost have to uh, not storyboard it, but you, you have some sort of, you have consistency with these people, right? I mean, these same characters come back and they're in the same towns and you, you know, is this all yeah. just in your head or you got this, no, when I was I was writing a book of stories about the town called Gruel, and that the book is called um, the book of stories is called Drowning in Gruel. Mm -hmm. Writing them and writing them, and writing them, and then just as a joke, I was kind of on a big drunk, and uh, and I was kind of getting some shit. My editor was named Andre Bernard. He's great. He was like the the publisher of Harcourt, and he was my editor. He only edited two people: Alice Walker and me. Wow. You know, two two different people, you know. I mean, right. I mean so, so anyway. Um so uh he called me up one time and I was I was writing it as a joke, I was writing a short story called Novel, and it's about a guy named Novel, blah blah blah. And it got to be about 30, 40 pages, so it was a little bit long. So he called me up one day and I, my mom was sick, she was living with us, I was on a drunk, I'm not the best son in the world. And uh, I said, hello. And he said, no, just like, and, and he's also like a Harvard guy and I'm not. So he's like, this is my best impression of Andre, whom I love. And he's like, hello, George, this is Andre. Hey, Andre, I'm just wondering, what are you up to now? And I said, and I lied. I said, I'm writing a novel. It's called Novel. It's about a guy named Novel. He's, uh, you know, he's writing a book. About, he's writing a long poem. And he's uh, and I went on and on about this, and I was just making off off the top of my head. And he offered me a lot of money, and I, I mean a ton, and I like six figures. And I went, uh, so I kind of sobered up real quick. So I got on the phone with him, and I call up my agent at that time. Her name's Liz Derensoff, and she said, "Oh, Andre's just blowing smoke up your ass." And I said, "Well, you gotta ask him, man. You know, I got a sick mom. I'm on a drunk." blah, blah, blah. And it all worked out, you know, so, so it was a two book deal as it ended up. So I, um, so I had those stories from Drowning in Gruel. And then I, then I wrote novel, the weirdo novel. Then I finished writing Drowning in Gruel and then novel from the novel shows up again as a, as a tombstone. It says he, he died. <laughs> Died at sea or something like that. I don't know what we you know. Drowned at sea or something like that. So, so you know, you I'm just I'm just kind of having fun making up shit. Right. So you don't have some uh, big. There's no big cork board in your house with everybody you know uh, mapped out on it with uh, yeah. where they live and all that good stuff. You so. All right. Yeah, so it, it, I'm not doing Yachna, Yachna Patafa or whatever. It's <laughs> I have little notes. It's funny when I keep finding these notes and going. Oh yeah, that's a great ad. I wonder if I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you. I, mean, I feel like a lot of the the story. I, I mean, as you read your stories, you you definitely are. Um, you have that uh, ability to. I feel like I'm seeing it through your eyes. You know, I feel like I'm 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 there, and I'm I'm seeing what's happening, and um, that. 
these stories seem to be based on because often there's nothing there's not really a lot there you're but it's just something some observation about you know humanity um built into this thing that just you know this is just how people are and like there's no moral to the story i guess is what i'm saying it feels like in some cases and you you have this but but it's there but it's just based on something that i can imagine you being there and in this scenario and then writing about it yeah there's always some little little thing Um, when we talk about ron rash ron always says i have a vision and i see something when i wrote serena i saw i'm not making fun of ron i love ron yeah when when i when i started serena's because i saw a woman riding a white horse and i give him shit about that because you know i can't and then i say I'm walking around and out of nowhere, a voice comes into my head. So the thing is, Ron sees things and I hear things. You hear things, okay. I hear voices. And then there's little things. <coughs> Excuse me, I got Corona. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, in the oh. old day, a long time ago, I lived in this little burg called Dacusville. And um, and I, I went into this place to buy some beer. I was buying a 12 pack of PBR at a Texco station. Dixville's a T in the road. There's, there's not even an intersection. It's a T. There was somebody getting gas, and the guy getting gas had a, a horse trailer. And in the back of the horse trailer were some llamas, because it's that kind of area where people are starting to uh, raise emus and llamas and alpacas, whatever. So I was in there and I was standing behind a guy. There was kind of a line. The guy in front of me had no shoes and no shirt and a big <laughs> belly. And so, you know, fuck that no shirt, no shoes stuff. He's just there. And I got my 12 pack of PBR and I was looking out of the llamas. And this guy was really looking out of the llamas. And then he turned to me and he said, What the hell kind of donkeys is them? And I went, Okay, buddy, I got to get home and write. Bye. <laughs> Let me make, did you scratch that down on the side of your PBR 12 pack? <laughs> what kind of donkeys is them? That was it for me, man. That's fantastic. See, it's just the, I mean, you have to, but you have to be there. Yeah. You know, out there picking up that PBR 12 pack at, in Dacus to, <laughs> to get that's that. What's ki- that's what's killing me about, that's what's killing me about this coronavirus. I can't steal anything. I mean, I can't right. go out anywhere, you know. I, it's not like I'm hanging out in bars or anything where normally somebody says something that I go, "Hey, man, that's a good line." You know? Right. I'm able to work a little bit for the first you're, time in my life. <laughs> you're, uh, yeah, you know, your next your next story is going to be uh, about uh, the the Callis Town Zoom meeting or something. It's going to be it's going to be so deadly. <laughs> oh, <man. clears throat> uh, are you writing? little bit you know uh yes oddly enough uh but i wasn't for a long time not, not, for me a long time means two weeks yeah um if, if i don't write for a week or two i just go ooh, we man i'm you know i'm pretty uh depressed so i've been writing this story i'm, I'm writing a bunch you know the last group of stories if i ever have another book out it's going to be about um nonprofits. But they're made up nonprofits. Um, I got these guys who are Vietnam War veterans, and they're good guys. They're older, and they're they're pro gun control. Mm-hmm. And they've started up a nonprofit called Veterans Against Guns in North America. But that comes out vagina. So uh, that store, that's coming out in a couple stores, Vet- Veterans Against Guns in North America. And they're great guys. Uh, I think I got a s- stories coming out in <laughs> Shut Up, Dave. So uh, that's normal. Uh, so one's coming out in like Epic Magazine, one's coming out in some other magazine. Uh, but, but then there are others where they're kind of, sh- these guys show up and... Uh, that's what I've been doing. Epic magazine. Veterans against guns in North America. All right, we gotta look. I'll for get that. I'll get yelled at. I'll get yelled at for that because um, it's 
politically incorrect. Can, Can you? Uh, we need to make some bumper stickers for that. I think so too. Mm -hmm. I think sure. you're right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's it. Yeah, it could happen. All right. Um, when you, uh, did you want to do any reading? I forgot to ask. Sorry. It's all right. How far are we along? What time is it? Um, about ask these people. Ask Twenty-five them, minutes in. Ask them if they want me to read five minutes. Can we do, do that or do, not? Do you people want them to read for five minutes? Uh, that's an enthusiastic yes from Deirdre. So. Okay. So in the meantime, folks, while while he's doing that, uh, pop in some questions into the chat. So. Okay. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna read this. I'm gonna read the end of a story. Okay. I've not read this in these goofy um, Zoom or whatever these things are called. I'm gonna read from a story called show and tell show and tell was the first story i ever wrote i wrote this in about 1999 2000 um which is a first person retrospective so it's an adult looking back at when he this in this case was a kid with kind of a crazy father and and this story kind of changed my life because it showed up in um atlantic monthly and then I had a slew of like 18 stories in one year, similar to this story. And in this story, this kid, Mendel Dawes, has a father. Mendel Dawes is in the third grade, and his uh, father, and he keeps having show and tell. And his father keeps saying, take this to show and tell, take this to show and tell. And they're think the kid doesn't know that his father and his teacher once had a relationship. And they broke up and it was an unceremonious relationship. So um, the father keeps giving him stuff like going, here, take this corsage, which ends up being the corsage that he gave his you know, girlfriend back in the day. It's a Mayan corsage. Uh, or read this letter. It's from Plato to Socrates. It's from, um, you know, another one was like, Peter Abelard to Eloise. It's got all these things. So this is the end of that story when the kid kind of figures things out. Can y'all hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? I didn't know that my father had been taking Fridays off in order to see the school secretary feign needing to leave me a bag lunch and then stand looking through the vertical window of my classroom door while I expounded on the rarity of a letter sweater once worn by General Custer or whoever. When the PTA meeting came around, I went with my father, though no other students attended. Pretty much it was only parents, teachers, and a couple of the lunch ladies who had volunteered to serve a punch of ginger ale and grape juice. My father entered Miss Suber's classroom and approached her as if she were a newspaper boy he had forgotten to pay. He said to her, I thought you'd eventually send a letter home asking for a conference. I thought you'd finally buckle under. To me, he said, I got a cigarette burn, hold on. To me, he said, go look at the goldfish, Mendel. You've always liked aquariums. Maybe I'll get you one. I looked at the corner of the room. My classmates' parents were sitting at tiny desks their knees bobbing like the shells of surface turtles. My third grade teacher said, I know you think this is cute, but it's not. I don't know why you think you can recourt me however many years later after what you did to me back then. My father pushed me in the direction of the aquarium. Miss Subra waved and smiled at Glenn Flack's parents who were walking in. I said to my dad, can I go sit in the car? Miss Suber said, you stay right here, Mendel. My father said, I might not have been able to go to college like you did, Lola, but I've done good for myself. I thought one thing only, Lola, I know you love me. I know, I know you have, Lee. I know you've done well. And let me be the first to say how proud I am of you and how I'm sorry if I hurt you and that I've seen you looking in the window 
when Mendel does his bogus show and tells. She pointed at the window in the door. Mr. and Mrs. Anderson walked in. My teacher said, I need to start this thing up. My father said to me, if you want to go sit in the car, go ahead. He handed me the keys, leaned down and said, there's a beer in the glove compartment, son. Let me say that this was South Carolina in 1968. Although my memory is not perfect, I think that at the time, neither drinking nor driving was against the law for minors, nor was smoking cigarettes before the age of 12. Five years later, I would drive my mini bike to the sunken gardens, meet one of the black boys twirling trays out in the parking lot, order my eight pack of Miller ponies and have it delivered to me without conscience or threat of law. I pretended to go into the parking lot, but circled around to the outside of Mrs. Suber's uh, classroom, Ms. Suber's classroom. I stood beneath one of the six jalousies, crouched and listened. Ms. Suber welcomed the parents and said that it was an exciting year. She said something about how all of us would have to take a national test later, see how we compared with the rest of the nation. She said something about a school play. Miss Suber warned parents of a looming head lice epidemic. She paced back and forth and asked everyone to introduce himself or herself. Someone asked if the school would ever sponsor another cake and pie sale in order to buy new recorders. My father said he'd be glad to have a potato salad and, coal sale, coal, and coleslaw sale. I didn't hear the teacher's answer. From where I crouched, I could only look up at the sky and notice how some stars twinkled madly while others shone hard and fast like mica of fire. It's a break. By the time I, oh, I should mention that um, this guy's uh, mother and father split up and also this guy's best friend's mother and father split up. By the time I reached high school, my mother had moved from Nashville to New Orleans and then from New Orleans to Las Vegas. She never made it as a country singer or a blues singer, but she seemed to thrive as a hostess of sorts. As I crouched there beneath a window jutting out above boxwoods, I thought of my mother and imagined what she might be doing at the moment my father was experiencing his first PTA meeting. Was she crooning to convention ears? Was she sitting in a back room worrying over uh, pantyhose? That's what I thought, I swear to God. Everyone in Miss Suber's classroom seemed to be talking with cookies in their mouths. I heard my father laugh twice. Once when Miss Suber said she knew that her students saw her as a witch, and another time when she said she knew that her students went home complaining that she didn't spank exactly the way their parents spanked. Again, this was in the middle of the Vietnam War, spanking made for good soldiers. My third grade teacher said that she didn't have anything else to say and told her students' parents to feel free to call her up should they have questions concerning grades, expectations, or field trips. She said she appreciated anyone who wanted to help chaperone kids or work after school in a tutoring capacity. I stood up and watched my friend's parents leave single file, my father last in line. 15 minutes after I'd gotten back in the car, five minutes after everyone else had driven into the parking lot, I climbed out of the passenger side and crept back to Miss Suber's window. I expected my father to have Lola Suber in a headlock or backed up against the famous Christians of the world corkboard display. I didn't under, I didn't foresee their having moved desks against the walls in order to make a better dance floor. My father held my third grade teacher in a way I'd, I'd seen him hold a woman only once before. One fourth of July, he had danced with my mother in the backyard while the neighbor shot bottle rockets straight up. My mother had placed her head on his shoulder and smiled, her eyes raised to the sky. Lola Suber didn't look upward. She didn't smile either. My father seemed to be humming or talking low. 
I couldn't hear exactly what went on, but years later, he confessed that he had set forth everything he meant to say and do, everything he hoped she taught the other students and me when it came to matters of passion. I did hear Lola Super remind him they had broken up because she had decided to have a serious and exclusive relationship with Jesus Christ. There amid the boxwoods, I hunkered down and thought only about the troubles I might have during future show and tells. I stood back up, saw them dancing, and returned to the car. I would let my father open the glove compartment later. Now, the reason why I read that was because, I don't know if you can see it. That's on page 158. Damn right. Fantastic. Who is the man? You are the man, <laughs> George. That's Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? That is cool. I had to I think about it. that. You're good, man. Everybody says I got no brain cells left, but I thought that one up. Man, I, that was not even planned. Like for me, I didn't. I didn't say no, Jordan. No, no, no. You're from page one fifty eight. No, you no. never did, man. I thought this up all by myself. I am impressed. I am really impressed. It's also. It's, it's also probably my favorite story. So so today, earlier today, I went. Oh, you know, page 158. Let me go see what's on page 158 of this fucking book. I mean, of this darn book. Right. So, sorry. Um, and I turned to it. And I went, it's show and tell. Oh, so I, so I had to jump back to page like 156 to get to it. It wouldn't have really made any sense. But, right. But that was fun. That's was a awesome. lot of fun. That's awesome. I, uh, I really appreciate you doing that. That's uh, excellent. And we got a couple of questions. So, uh, Deirdre wanted to know, uh, are all the characters always talking in your head? Uh, uh, kind of. I mean, you know, I don't want to say I'm nuts or anything, but, but yeah, I kind of hear these. I, I kind of hear these. I mean, I just walk around and hear, you know, I hear dialogue a lot. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of interesting. So, so you, um, like you said before, Ron, Ron sees things and, and you hear them. Um, are, do you feel like there's that? Um, I mean, are you hearing thing like, like this itches y'all and, and you go, what yeah. the, what the hell is that? And you know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I can tell you all about that story. I mean, that's exactly what happened was I was just walking around and went, this itches, y'all. I may have heard someone say that. I may have heard someone say, this itches, y'all. I went, what the hell? You know, I mean, sometimes I'm stealing, but yeah. Well, kind of. I mean, somebody just saying something isn't stealing. That's, that's like you said, if you're sitting in a bar and somebody makes a, you know. But you, know, you, you got to sit back and say, is this person going to be writing a story? Right. Probably not. Odds are good I'll enough. Steal it. Yeah. And, you know, that uh, particular story, too, um, I, I don't know that they would have, anybody would have come up with that. So with with yeah. that in mind, um, Randy had a question about 50 years from now, will someone get a doctorate for writing George Singleton, the use of headlights as a metaphor in Southern short stories? <laughs> and, <laughs> and quite probably. And, and No, is that Randy Ford? Yeah, Randy. No, Randy Ford, you know that's not going to happen. Unless they're carrying around a big saxophone with them and living in Nashville. Randy's a saxophonist. Who's oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. In Nashville? Yeah, yeah, man. Excellent. Randy, write about it. Randy, can you write about this or not? Let's see if he does. Randy's having a hard time because, you know, Nashville's a music town and, and fucking COVID's... Uh, closed it down so absolutely yeah I don't, think he's, I don't think he's playing yeah no work now he no says work now. yeah are they, are they did they just open up the rhyming for something did i see were they doing trying to do something there with that they're trying to do something socially distant or something i'd like to know this myself they're trying Randy, you, yeah yeah okay yeah i thought i read something that they were trying to do something there i i hope they can pull that off because me too yeah, it needs. You know, to. Nashville's been Nashville's been nailed by 
tornado, flood, maybe not in this order, flood, tornado, virus, hmm. maybe, maybe another tornado. I mean, things have been bad. Yeah. And that's, you know, I'm doing, uh, uh, with Ron Rash, uh, Fellowship Southern Writers, virtually. It's, it's not, it's going to be, it's going to suck. It's sad, you know. Yeah, I, well, I mean, because I, I, having seen, you know, you in person interacting with others, I can only imagine how awesome that is. You know, well, just. I, when I talked to Ron yesterday or whatever, and we were, this is bad, I should be telling everybody. But we were talking about this thing with the questions on the sidebar. Yep. And um, we're just going to pretend like I'm going to go, here's a question, Ron. Yeah, good. Uh, um, when's the last time you ate rutabaga? Right. Or whatever. We'll Come up with something go, ridiculous. We're just do some bullshit. So. Good. Oh, that'd be fun, actually, though. I, th I think we're going to have fun. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Um, Deidre also wants to know, has anybody accused you of writing about them? Yeah. Oh, I could see oh, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I've written, I've used some real names. In, in so, one whole book, I used a woman named um, Shirley Ebo. Yeah. She, so she was a real African American. My dad had this friend named Mr. Ebo, and it was his niece. And she was in a, she was in my whites. She was this before um, integration, but she went to my, elementary school she was sad i mean she just seemed sad and and, and i felt guilty about it hmm. so i wrote a kind of a whole book about her she shows up in a couple books yeah, she's in the she, she shows up in that story i just read you know? she's and she's in the little league game too yeah she's in the stand um, um so i've written about them but then also there have been people you know one time this woman kind of crazy so i had a story that came out in playboy magazine and it was a story about uh can you talk about that yeah this couple is uh, my playboy stories are like the cleanest stories i've written <laughs> story about it this took place at in my mind camp skyuka in north carolina maybe some of y'all have been to camp skyuka it's above columbus north carolina and I wrote this story, and the guy, the main character says, uh, my neighbor was a crazy but beautiful woman. Something, something, something. This woman showed up, and I was there with a frame and hammer. I was working, Glenn and I were building this house. So we were a lot younger. We were in our 30s, and we were building this house. So I was doing this um, um, underlayment stuff. Out of nowhere, this woman said, you wrote about me in this magazine, and my husband's very upset about it. And I went, well, I, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, lady. And she said, "You blah, 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 blah. You wrote about me. And I said, I wrote about a crazy and beautiful woman. And and you're crazy, but I don't really think you're that beautiful. So it's not me. Man, she, uh, and then they moved, they moved away. <laughs> they moved to the West Coast. <laughs> So, yeah, sometimes, and, you know, there's also sometimes people say, like, you're writing about me, or I know that's me, and I go, oh, oh no. I mean. Yeah. I, when, I, when I'm really writing about somebody, they don't get it, and when I'm not, they think it's them. Right. Right. I feel like a lot of the character, well, some of the characters you have, are they're pretty smart. I mean, they're, they're philosophizing. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Go ahead, uh, right. Anybody I know. I had a question for you about um, your process. You wrote uh, an, an essay a long time ago for, well, not a long time ago, but a while ago for Tin House, right? Um, about your process. And uh, like you, you already talked about like how you hear and not see, but like when you get into is short story writing, um, and maybe this is why it's so, it's so different than novel writing. I mean, I don't, but I don't know. You tell me. Is it is it that? Do you just sit down and bang out a short story, or are you? Are you, um, you know, where it's going to end. You're plotting. You're 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 going through all those mechanics, or are you? Um... Yeah, I mean, I, normally I think I know where it's going to end, but but I don't know. And uh, and there's always these 
you know, shifts that I don't, I don't know it's going to take. Um, you know, like this morning I reread 3,000 words or whatever of what I've been and kind of changing that along the way and going, oh yeah, this has to, this has to change because it's going to go this way. I mean, it, it changes kind of every one. You kind of editing on the, you edit as you go sort of thing or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you physically write? Well, in the old days, in that tin house thing, mm -hmm. uh, and I change, I hand write, um, write on the computer. But lately, I've, I'm just being on the computer. It, yep. it doesn't matter. The main thing is like going back and rereading and rereading and rereading. Right. So how long does it take to? On a good day. Story? On a, on a good, if things are going perfectly, uh, you know, a week, because it's like a thousand words, go back and read those thousand, change those a little bit, write another thousand, go go read those two thousand. That never, had, that, that hadn't happened in years. It, seem, it seems like, I don't know. But, uh, but back then, that shit didn't get published probably, you know. Right. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, but, but, you know, if I'm really working and I'm having a good old time and, and I'm really paying attention and, it, it, you know, I can get a story out in a couple of weeks. I mean, it's not, it's not like roofing. Yeah, that's good. Dig, digging a ditch or anything. I mean, it's, right. it's you know, I, I get real upset with uh, writers who go, writing is so hard. And I go, man, have you ever had a manual labor job? Right, right. God damn, man, this is the easiest shit in the world. I used to be uh, uh, an electrician, and the first um, probably year or so being an electrician, you don't touch a wire or a pair of pliers. You, yeah, I bet. You, you touch shovels, and you know <laughs> that's that's what you do. So when something needs to be dug, you dig it. And uh, when today, something drilled, today, you drill it. Today I did some writing, and then, oh man, I, Glenn is gonna kill me. I hope she's not on this thing. Uh, I mean, she won't she, that, she, she, She's turned my life into Sisyphe. She's been putting all this pile of um, kind of large limbs and twigs and shit because she says there's, there's some kind of erosion going on. But then she says, I don't like that. So she's pulled it back and I got to burn it. So I was burning some limbs as I do, as I've done for the last 10 days, except for the last couple of days, there was a lot of rain. And then she, she made a new deck uh, for some kind of potting thing. I don't know, a potting table or whatever. I went, okay. And then she said, well, it's too high to step on. I got to make these steps. And she got these, um, pallets out and then I watched her I was burning shit and I was watching her and she had out a um, a jigsaw mm -hmm. that, that jigsaw is not going to be able to cut through pallet wood pallet because that, no. that, that's, that's yeah. like, I don't know what pallet thin, wood thin blade. Out, but yeah it's, it's, it's hard stuff, stuff. yeah so then the next thing she went I can't I can't do this can you help me so I went and got my, my father's uh circular saw and when you this thing's from like the 50s yeah and, and the the uh, cord on it is frayed and it and the the little uh bar on it you know the safety bar is questionable yeah and when you turn it on it goes eh, i mean it just hurts your teeth i mean it's <laughs> terrible so i eh, you know doing this stuff and i, I got it done we got the stupid step and all that but but you know i would rather be writing than doing that bullshit mm -hmm. absolutely are you um are you working on a, a specific project now or are you just writing You're just writing just stories yeah, yeah okay stories. yeah a lot of uh, uh a lot of writers right now like um we've been asking are do you see the current um, situation working its way into your writing at all right now, or are you kind of 
stay in the far freaking way from it as you can. Funny, with the story I'm writing about this woman and these, uh, I'm writing a story that a woman is uh, rehabbing a house. And now this may be because I've watched all these rehab store, uh, the TV shows of rehab, you know. I hate my bathroom. Yeah, you know, <laughs> whatever. I like these two, these this couple down in Laurel, Mississippi. I like them a lot, but. But I started writing about this guy, and he's got a hook for his hand, and he's playing shuffleboard. I don't know. Uh, and a, <laughs> woman, good. a guy with a port wine stain that looks like a snapdragon, and these hummingbirds are following him around. I don't, I don't know where this story is going, but it's bad. It's probably bad, but that's what I'm writing. Um, uh, I don't know where it's going to go. Love it. That's what I'm writing. Well, if you ever need early readers, let me know. <laughs> I'll send it to you. <laughs> send um, it my way. Uh, I have found, I think the story I wrote before that, I kept finding myself with people with masks. And I thought, I don't want to be one of those people that, you know, there's probably everybody, there must be a million writers right now writing about coronavirus. And, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to do that. I've been reading a ton. There's been a bunch of good books out in, yep. the in this season. There's a ton, but man, some of them are depressing. Like I'm, and I love these books, but uh, Hieroglyphics by Jill McCorkle. Yes, it's great, yep. but it's depressing. And this guy Jamie uh, Poisson who wrote Lake Life. Oh my God, it's a great novel, but it's depressing. And this guy named Emma Walsh because his, his, his name is Neil. And he wrote uh, the Big Door Prize. It's it's a great fucking novel. I mean, it's so good. And Lee Smith. I'm looking at him right over here. Lee Smith wrote uh, Blue Marlin. Sold yep. novella. God damn, it's great. And Sleepovers by Ashley Bryant Lee uh, Bryant Phillips. Ashley Bryant Phillips. Great stories. There's this one called F Asterisk. Asterisk, CK, face, face, yeah, by Leah Hampton. Fantastic book. It's a great book. Yep. There've been these great books that, but the sad ones are killing me, man. Yeah. yeah. What What else? Do you, uh, so, what's your what's what's your favorite thing you've read during the quarantine or whatever you want to call it? You know, it might be my buddy Ron Rash's uh, book in the Valley. Yeah, his his I new one. I think that's really great. It's a little I'm reading it right now. The novella and some short stories. I think yep. it's really great. You know, it's it's really, it's re it's really really great. Not because he's my buddy. No, he's got a, he's he's a great writer, no doubt. And, you know, an another one is uh, uh, "When These Mountains Burn" by David Joy. It's a different, you know, it's a, uh, it's great. Yep, it's, it's great. His, uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, if, if the folks listening haven't read that book yet, um, the last chapter or so of that book is some of the finest writing. It's, the last chapter of that book, I wrote him and I went, you motherfucker. Oh, sorry. Right? <laughs> but that's, that's what I wrote him. That's what I wrote him. I went, God almighty, man, because it kind of goes into the future a little bit, you yeah. know, or, yeah. or, and, and it's just beautiful. It's poetic. Yeah, uh, he's, he's, yeah, continues to impress. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, another question. Oh, so Deidre had a great idea. If somebody writes some um, country songs based on your stories. <laughs> <laughs> that could happen. Uh, George Jones is dead, so it doesn't matter. George ah. Jones is the only country singer I know. <laughs> you know. I, I mean, I could. somebody's going to make a, a song called this itches y'all <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things you can rhyme with y'all y'all yeah. yeah exactly uh the um the the story where they they go to the teacher's house to learn sex ed from her husband um and and end up fishing for mice through their living room floor <laughs> i mean that's a country song listen uh, listen <laughs> oh man uh once upon a time I was asked to go teach his class up in West Virginia at West Virginia Wesleyan College. 
in Buckhannon, West Virginia. And they had a little low residency thing, right? Uh, so I said, so I thought I'm going to read this story. But they didn't tell me that they were bringing a couple busloads of high school kids <laughs> to that um, reading. And, and I kind of forgot the story, so I started reading it. And then when I got to this point where those guys were, this one kid says, I know what yep. vagina feels like. Put this noxema under my armpit and stick your pecker under there or whatever. Um, whatever. God almighty, man, here I go with these high school kids. And I just read right through it. And then one of those teachers came up to me later. She was a little bit bitter. And she said, I hope you know that that noxema burns real bad if you did something like that. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I wouldn't know. That's kind of the end of that story. <laughs> that's a funny story, though. I mean, that's not a bad, you know, it's called uh, Fresh Meat on Wheels. The name right. Is. Yeah, because the, the, the husband drives a meat truck, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um... And I know we got just a couple more minutes left, but you um, you do feature uh, uh, dogs quite a bit in your in your stories. I love that. Um, I'm a total dog dog guy. And um, do you have do you have a hound right now? I got three. Three. But but in the past I've had eleven. Um, I've had a bunch. I've had two two dogs that look to be twenty. Right now, what my I hate to say I have a favorite dog, but uh, my dog Mabel has cancer, and we got to go. Oh. She's got surgery uh, next week. Um, I've written about her in Gardening Gun. Um, um, she's a crazy dog. Uh, yeah, I, I was talking to someone. I was talking to Danny Wallace, who wrote Big Fish sure. last night, and we were talking about. I have never in my life, and I'm 62 years old. I've never lived without a dog. There's always been at least one dog in my life. I have one. I have one two-year period. Really? From birth yeah. to now, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's so so weird. And at that point in time, I shouldn't have had a dog, which is it's good, but you know. Yeah. We have four now. That's a lot. I can't say no to a dog. Good for you, man. Good for yeah, you. Yeah. You know, they're good. Right, and you obviously—I mean, look at all the dogs on that cover. I know, isn't that funny? It's awesome. I love it. Some, some idiot woman who uh, interviewed me from a newspaper. Her first question was, Are those why, your dogs? "Why did you choose all those dogs on your cover?" And I went, "I, I don't really do the covers." And then she, <laughs> the second question was, "Why do you like dogs?" Well, what the fuck kind of questions are these? Oh, why do you, do you like dogs? <laughs> what are you fucking Trump? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> we're going to wrap yeah. it up. <laughs> Perfect. George, thank you so much for taking the time and being here with us. Uh, I love Dave, talking. I got, I got one more thing to say. You say it. There's this little green button down here that says buy the book. Come on, y'all. <laughs> there you go. Buy I the had book. A great time. We gotta have we gotta get George some new shoes. Make sure he's he's in shoes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So man, we really appreciate it. Uh always great talking to you. I look forward so much. Next time, um, we have a tradition at our store when we have author events that uh the authors sign our bathroom wall. So oh, we I are can't wait. we are can't extending wait. that courtesy to anybody who um has, does a virtual event with us. So next time you're in Wake Forest, you know, we'll we'll have a party and um I'm there. And, uh, you got to sign the bathroom wall. So think up there something was. good. Think up something good. All right, buddy. All right. Take care. All right, Thanks man. Y Bye, y'all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.